there's more to the updated Mitsubishi Triton than just a new look. The brand has improved safety and comfort and convenience across the board, but the sad news is that prices are up. So can the updated Triton justify its extra expenditure? Well, we'll get to that soon, but first, let's take a closer look at the design. I'm not the only one who thinks that this new facelift version of the Triton is probably the best facelift that Mitsubishi's ever done. It's got the new dynamic shield design language, which basically makes it look more masculine and more aggressive. There's new headlights, a new grille, new chunky bumper, and on this car there's even a nudge bar. And as well as all that, the ground clearance has been improved. Now that makes it better off-road. You'll have to watch the rest of the video to see how it fares off-road. The rear end has been redesigned too, and there's less of the rounded edges look that we've come to expect from the Triton. I think it looks really tough. And it remains pretty good in terms of payload capacity, with up to 956 kilos of loadability for dual cab pickups, which is what most people buy. Plus, there's towing capacity of up to 3.1 tonnes for a brake trailer. The class leaders can do 3.5. Now, let's check out the inside. The changes may not appear to have been massive in here, but there have been some thoughtful additions. There's a phone holder in front of the gear shift. There's better storage as well as covered storage with a soft finish on it. There's soft finishes on the doors and nice knee pads here so you don't bash your legs too much when you go off road. In the high spec versions like this one, the GLS Premium, you get a bigger media screen, a seven inch touch screen with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, plus digital radio, Bluetooth phone and audio streaming, and there's USB connectivity. You've got a couple of USB points up front and a couple in the back as well, so everyone can keep their devices charged. In the lower grade models, there is a smaller screen without the smartphone connectivity, which is a bit of a bugger, and no model comes with sat-nav as standard. In front of the driver, there's a new info cluster display, but no digital speedo, which is a bit annoying in places where speed can be enforced for just one or two k's over the limit. But generally, the appearance and the feel of the cabin is improved. Might not be a huge change, but it's a worthwhile one. The back seat of the Triton offers reasonable space for adults. I'm six foot tall. This seat is set in my position and I've got enough knee room to be pretty comfortable. Toe room is a little bit tight, but it's fairly comfy back here. And it's even more comfy this time around because there's an air circulator, which is basically a little fan that pumps a bit of cold air from the front into the back. It's not proper vents, so it might not be as effective on really hot days, but at least it's something. If you're not planning to put adults like me in the back, if you've got kids, for example, there are Isofix child seat anchor points on either side, and you'll be able to hook the top tethers in over the top of the back seat as well. There's a flip down armrest with cup holders, and you get bottle holders and mat pockets as well. So it's pretty good back here. Safety gear in the high grade models is exceptional and lower spec models are still pretty well equipped but they miss out on some of the active safety gear. Make sure you read the full review at carsguide.com.au for all the details on what's fitted to each grade of the Triton range. Now let's take it for a spin. The Triton has never been a class leader in terms of pretty much anything. Dynamically it's never been the best and the engine has never been the best, but it's never been the most expensive either, so it hasn't had to be the best. This time around, prices are up, so it needs to be better, and it is. The ride has been improved. The suspension has been reworked, so the higher spec models get a slightly different tune. Basically, they've got one of the leaf springs at the back removed to make it a bit more comfortable. The car I'm in now is the GLS Premium, which rides on 18-inch wheels. And there's nothing in the tray, so there's nothing holding it down at the back. And that means that it can feel a little bit jittery over smaller inconsistencies in the road surface. But generally, it's not uncomfortable. So if you're buying this as a high-spec car that maybe you use for dual purposes, you won't be too disappointed. It's comfortable enough. 
the engine hasn't changed. The power and torque outputs are exactly the same as they were before, but there's a new six-speed automatic transmission which does make it a little bit more usable. It doesn't feel as stressed at higher speeds on the open road. And it does feel like it picks up a little bit quicker from a standstill because it's got different gear ratios. The lack of a digital speedo isn't ideal in city settings, especially if there's lots of speed cameras around. One thing I wish was improved in this new generation Triton just a bit would be engine noise insulation. It's still really noisy when you do put your foot down. And I mean, it's not on its own in the class. A lot of utes are pretty noisy because they're running diesel engines, but some of the other utes are quieter than this. So maybe that could be better. Also, and it might seem like a very trivial criticism, but the air conditioning is freezing. You set it on 24 and it feels like about 21. Set it on 27, you're about right. The Triton's steering, again, never been a benchmark setter, but it's reactive enough. It's not too slow at low speeds, not too heavy. It's fine. And of course there are paddle shifters on this high spec if you want to take matters into your own hands, but that's more for off-road or when you're towing. Speaking of off-road, here we go. It wouldn't be a four-wheel drive ute launch without some off-roading and today we've spent quite a bit of time off-road. We've done a rocky hill climb with wet stones underneath and mud puddles and splashes and some bits where it was a little bit treacherous and then we came to the sandier part of Tasmania's coast and it's been a little bit treacherous here too but the Triton has survived everything we've thrown at it. The updated Super Select system now includes Drive Mode Select. So right now I'm in 4 high with the center diff locked and I've got modes such as Sand, which I'm in right now, Gravel and Mud and Snow. And as you can probably hear, when I took it out of Sand, it triggered the transmission to drop. Put it back up, the transmission picks that gear up again. and. What it's doing is allowing you enough revs to get out of trouble if you find yourself in trouble. If you put it into four wheel drive low mode, then you get an extra mode, which is rocks. And it worked terrifically on a very slippery, rocky slope. Impressed? Well, we already knew the Super Select system was good, but they've just made it even better. The GLS Premium comes with a rear diff lock and it comes with that drive mode selection, super select. And it is a nice addition to the range. We already knew that it was capable off-road. There's good articulation. And in these higher spec models with the bigger wheels, you get bigger brakes too. And I have to say that the brake performance has been good. Nice longevity and also good feel through the pedal. It pulled up strong and it got everywhere we asked it to go. At the time of filming, Mitsubishi is offering the Triton with a 7-year, 150,000k warranty, a new benchmark in the ute segment. Hopefully that plan remains, at the moment it's just a promotional thing. Servicing is covered by a cap price plan that spans only 3 years. Other utes offer lifetime cap price service. There is no denying that the updated Mitsubishi Triton offers even more appeal than the model that came before it, and not just because it looks better, and the fact that it remains one of the more affordable dual cab utes from a reputable maker just adds to that appeal. 